today we are in week two of our series called Made. We're going verse by verse through the, through the book of Colossians together. Last week was week one, so if you missed it, uh, we made it through 14 verses. Uh, so it's, there's a lot there. Uh, so you might want to go check that out online, or you can download the Faith Journey app. You can check that out uh, there as well. But we are going verse by verse, and if speaking of the app, if you don't have your Bible with us, uh, it's going to be on the screen with you today. It's going to be on the screen, but you can also follow along uh, with the, the Bible app or the, the Faith Journey app as well. It's a big, it's a big deal. So we're going through the study of Colossians, and what we've really found out is that the, the, through the book of Colossians that Paul was really addressing some, some problems, some things that were creeping into the Colossian church. Uh, and Paul wanted to warn the believers about these things. And there's a few things. We're going to touch on a couple of them. Uh, one was dualism, just they were, they, that Jesus wasn't enough by Himself, that there's something else that you needed to kind of accompany Jesus that to, to get forgiveness for your sins. Uh, it was kind of this method where they were introducing Greek philosophy with Christian theology. Uh, there was a, the city of Colossae was a kind of an epicenter for for trade, and so there was a lot of uh, a lot of ideas being shared around. And so some of those ideas got seeped into the church because it was in the culture. And so we see this idea of Greek philosophy mixed with Christ, Christian theology, and Paul's like, we got to clean this up a little bit. So there were some dualism ideas going on. There was some legalistic activity happening. People were told that if they really wanted to follow or become followers of Jesus, they had to do it exactly like others had done it, or it wasn't good enough. For instance, uh, though, you know, for Jewish people uh, to come to Jesus, or for, for they were telling Gentile folks that they had to first become Jewish, then they could become Christian. Like that was, you had to kind of go through this process. And so Paul was like, we got to squash a little bit of that. Uh, there's a third thing. There was mysticism was on, was on the rise. People were into angel worship a lot. Uh, people were into uh, just kind of, it was, it was an emphasis on discovering the secret wisdom and secret knowledge from God. Like there was something that you could only kind of come to grips with if you had kind of the secret information that wasn't available to everybody, but only a select few. And so because of these several misconceptions that were kind of going on about Christ, uh, they, because they sort of started to surface through the, these false teachers, uh, they, they, there was a few misconceptions that they kind of perpetrated because of those different misaligned belief systems. One, that false teachers argued that God would not have come to earth in hum, as a human being in bodily form because the physical world was in and of itself evil. So because the physical world was evil, God would not, would, would not send his son, who was God, to be in bodily form, thus putting him into an evil place. So, of course, Paul is going to refute that. We're going to look at that a little bit. Another belief was that God uh, did not create the world because he would not create something that is evil. So Paul's addressing a little bit of that. Thirdly, it was that Christ was not the unique son of God, but was one of many intermediaries between God and people. And so Paul is trying to like, oh man, there's a lot, there's a lot we got we got to talk about. And the lastly, there was this refusal of, and we've kind of touched on this already, to see Christ as the sole source of salvation, insisting that people couldn't find God, uh, could they could find God through this special knowledge or secret wisdom as well, but they needed to be, it wasn't just Jesus. You might, you might, and so Paul writes this letter to this church addressing all these things, and some of these things are very familiar to us today. We, 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 see it, we see it a lot in our world today. Today, people are still trying to mix Christian theology with something else. They're bringing it into the, the church and to, 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 Christian, uh, to Christianity because they think that it marries itself or it needs to be able to accompany it for you to be really saved. Like, you need to kind of marry these things together. I actually, we need to make sure that what the, what, you know, what the word says is what the word says. We shouldn't mix it with other things. But we sing it a lot today, people trying to mix Christian theology with other things. People are still trying to live legalistically and hold others to this kind of a standard. People are enamored with mysticism now more than ever. And so this message not only hits home to the Colossian church, but it, it hits home for us 
today. In fact, one of the, the theologian uh, that was studying, kind of get ready for this message, Lightfoot, he said that the book of Colossians is, in this book, the doctrine of the person of Christ is stated with more precision and fullness than any other epistle of the Apostle Paul. And he, Paul goes, he's like, I'm going to drill down on this idea that Jesus is God. That Jesus is supreme. That Jesus is who, you know, the, the, the beginning and the end. That he is the man. Like he is, he is, he is the, he's the one. Now, that, that poses a question. Can you spot a fake? Like I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to kind of put some things on the screen today and see if you could spot the real thing from the fake thing. Um, but we don't have time for that. We're going we're gonna, to, but I think it's interesting that we, we need to know how we can spot a fake Thing. Deep fakes are real. Have you heard of deep fakes? Right? Deep fakes are, 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 are basically computer generated um, photos or videos, mainly videos, where someone has kind of taken a face image and it, and they, of somebody else and they put it on another person. And so it makes it look like that person that you know is saying the things that you're going, why would that person even say that thing? It doesn't, doesn't sound like them, like something like they would say. But I see it. I see it's that person and I'm getting tricked by the internet again. It's AI meets, you know, 2024. It's this idea of, uh, and so we have to know how to separate what's real from what's fake. And the apartment with the Colossian church was they were like, man, so much was seeping in. They were trying to figure out what was real and what was not real at all. So they say the best way to spot a counterfeit is to know the original. The best way to spot the counterfeit is to know the original. There's this store in San Francisco called The Real Real. And they specialize in, like, high-quality goods. Uh, like, you know, you know, purses and belts and clothing items. for Like, you know, designer, high-end designer labels. And so their whole idea is, like, we're going to spot a fake. They have someone on their staff that is called the Senior Expert Authenticator. They know how to spot a fake. They're like, well, this overlap happens from left to right, where on this fake one is from right to left. This one, the spacing is a little off. You can see the font is just slightly different. This one, you can see, like, this bag, this bag has two pockets where the original has one pocket. And if you flip it over here, up here, there's a, a factory kind of authenticator you know, tag right here. If you move this and move this over, it's like they know everything about it. Like, the best way to spot a fake is to know the original. You have, to, you have to know that. Now, in the world of ever-increasing AI and deep fakes and counterfeits, authenticity is what the world needs now more than ever. Nothing is import more important to Christian discipleship than a fresh, clear, true vision of the authentic Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. As we understand Jesus more and more, as we surrender ourselves to his, his leadership and our lives, we will see that we are being made into something beautiful and so much more than we could ever be on our own. So we're going to pick up where we left off last week in chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 15. It says this, it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before every, anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. This is a power-packed verse and a half. It's one of the strongest statements about the divine nature of Jesus anywhere found in the Bible. Jesus is not only equal to God... As it says in Philippians chapter 2, which Paul wrote, he said he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself a servant to, to be able to, to, to serve us. But, he, but he, right, Paul is saying he is the visible image. He's the visible image of the invisible God. He's not only equal to God, he is God. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the exact representation of of God. He not only reflects God, but he reveals God to us. In fact, in John chapter 1, it says as much. It says in verse 18 of John chapter 1, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is here is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. 
He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. There's another, um, you know, they're supreme over all creation. There's other translation that says he's the firstborn over all creation. He's the first, as firstborn over all creation, he has priority and the authority associated with that position. He is Lord of all. He is supreme over all creation, including the spirit world. Paul is basically saying, hey, these are the credentials you need to know about Jesus. We see Paul in other books, and even at the beginning of Colossians, be able to, to start out the book saying, hey, this is why, I, he, here are my credentials. I, he, he starts out the, the, the letter by saying, I'm chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ, uh, and, and, and I'm going to proclaim this. He ends this chapter with it again. We're going to read. He, he basically says, hey, this is who I am. But right now he's establishing Jesus' credentials. He's saying Jesus is God. You and I were made in his image and likeness. But Jesus is his image. I love what, 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 uh, what Paul is really uh, iterating here. He's saying that, that God is spirit. And what that means is that God is not visible to the human eye. But Jesus came and walked this earth and lived this life to make, and the invisible became visible. The invisible becomes visible. This is what we call the incarnation. That the word incarnation means in the flesh. In fact, in, back in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He became flesh and moved into the neighborhood, essentially. This incarnation of God. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. You, he, it's his image. You want to know what Abraham Lincoln looks like? Look at a penny. If you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. Not the physical appearance as so much as like the example that he lived out. The, the person of Jesus. The sacrificial love, the grace, the goodness. What Paul is telling us is that Jesus' life is the one that we should look at. That Jesus perfectly reflects the life and character of the Father. So follow his example. We see that he is created for through him. For through him, God has created everything in the heavenly realms. Let's do this. Heavenly realms and on earth. What I love about this, get this. The visible. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He, that's an awesome line. Can you, you guys are jealous. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. There's visible things that we've seen him create on earth, but there's invisible things that also have been created in heavenly realms. There are things that are happening on both ends, even things, things that we cannot see. We're going to read that in the next verse. Basically, Paul is saying these are expert credentials. Jesus is God. There is a saying that's been very popularized over the last year and a half. It's a, it's a phrase of taking the sports world by storm. It's quite simple. It's one that's does not, it's not even grammatically correct. But it is like, rest assured, your favorite athlete has quite likely uttered these iconic words at one point or not over the past year. And it's the words, I'm him. I'm him. I've seen it. I've seen it. You, you see it all the time. You see it on highlights. It's a term that's spanned across playing surfaces from LeBron James to my man Joe Burrow. I mean, they're all say it. Premier League grounds to dusty black tops. I'm him is the in vogue motto of those teaming with swagger and bravado and confidence. It's a dominant figure. The great of the great, the greatest of the greats. I'm him. Well, Paul says in another book in 2 Corinthians, he says, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. What is Paul doing here in the beginning of Colossians? He's saying he's him. Jesus is him. It's all about him. It's not about me. Look at Jesus. He is him. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. He's him. Through him, everything was created in heavenly realms and on earth. I love what Pastor Tyler Staten put, points out in his book, Pray Like Monks, Live Like Fools. He says this, he says, the grounding text for the Jewish people's understanding of God was the book of Exodus, 
when the Lord appeared to people in the form of a cloud by day and fire by night. The big question in ancient days wasn't does God exist? It would be foolish to ask such a question. Of course God exists. Open your eyes. He's the cylindrical pillar of fire stretching from the desert floor into the night sky and serves as our trail guide. The existed, these existential question for the ancient years was, is God knowable? Because a pillar of fire doesn't provoke doubt, but neither does it provide intimacy. What he's saying is Jesus makes God knowable. He is the visible image of the invisible God. We can re- we, we, we've seen him. He walked this wor- earth. People talked with him. He related with folks. We see what he did on earth. It's recorded in human history. He is the visible image of the invisible God. He has revealed God to us. Jesus makes God knowable. When you follow Jesus, you are following God. All right, that's one verse today. Ready to go on to the next verse? Verse 16 says, he made the things that we can see and the things that we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and unseen and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before everything else, anything else, and he holds all creation together. This, this phrase that we talked about before at the beginning of verse 16 that was on the other slide, that he is the firstborn of all creation, has unfortunately been misused over the years. That teach that Jesus was the first created being. This is what Arianism and Jehovah's Witnesses believe. They use a misinterpretation of this Colossians passage to say that Jesus was as a created being rather than eternal. But it says that he was with God in the beginning, that he was there, that he, you know, he was the first of all these things, that he is supreme over all creation, that he was with God. He wasn't created in the beginning. He was already was with God. He was the originator. And because the false teachers believed that the physical world was evil, they thought that God himself could not have created it. If God, if Christ were God, they reasoned that he would only be in charge of the spiritual world. But verse 16 says that all things, he made all things, were created by, were created by him and for him. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else. And he holds all creation together. He made the, he made the things that we can see and the things that we can't see, right? He made, he made it all. through. This is who, how God chose to, to move among us. He, he, made, he made the things that we can see in this world, but he also, there, he, but Paul is saying there are things in this, that are in this world that we cannot see. There are thrones and kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. I love what Louis Giglio says. He says, this verse alone is massive because it answers two of the biggest questions that all of humanity asks. There are two questions that everyone asks. Does my life matter and why am I here? Does my life matter and why am I here? What what Paul is saying is that we, everything, everything, including you, everything was created through him which means your life matters. He created you. Your life matters. And for him, why am I here? What's my purpose? My purpose is for him. We start getting to twist it a little bit. It's like, man, I got to find my purpose. I got to find what I'm on, put on this earth to do. I gotta put, find what my dreams are, what, what my passions are, and all those are good things to identify because God has put in you innate giftings and, and, and passions and, and skills. He's gifted you with these things. But the ultimate purpose that you were created was for Him. You're created through Him and for Him. And I love this. There, he holds all creation together. 
It's like we have that whole, you know, he holds the whole world in his hands kind of song, right? We, we, I guess it's trite. But that's what it is. He's holding everything together. And who better to hold life together, to hold the world together, hold all creation together? Because if it was up to me, it would be unraveled by now. If it was up to mankind, it's not just me, anybody. If it's up to all of us put together, it's kind of a mess, right? But he holds it all together. What I love about what it's Paul is saying here is that there was never a time when God, the Fa- when God the Father was not the Father, and there was never a time when Jesus was not the Son. He was there at the beginning. Everything was there. Um, everything was created through him and for him. God is not only the creator of the world, but he is the sustainer of the world. He holds creation together. He is a sustainer, protected and prevented from disintegrating into chaos because Christ is the sustainer of all life. None of us are independent from him. He made all things, things we can see, things we can't see, like things in the unseen world where everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. It says in verse 19 or 18 that 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 Christ is also the head of the church. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. He is supreme in everything. He's the head of the church, and he is the first over all who rise from the dead. He's the first. Again, Paul is saying, I'm about to boast in Jesus. He is him. He is first. He is supreme. He is over all. Christ is over the head of the church, which is his body. When we talk about the body of Christ, it sounds weird to say, but this is where it comes from, right? We are the body. Christ is the head. We are the body. He is the thing that is moving everything and holding all things together. He is the sustainer of life. He is the head of the church, which is his body. He's supreme over all who rise from the dead. This is his movement. He is in charge. We're taking our cues from him. Jesus is the center of everything. And Christ is the firstborn from among the dead. Jesus was raised from death, and his resurrection proves his lordship over the material world. All who trust in Christ will also defeat death and will rise again to live eternally with him. So what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He's saying, hey, there will be a day when we will rise with him, but Christ is first. Does it mean that he was the first one to rise from the dead? Of course not. We've seen people in the Old Testament rise from the dead. We saw Lazarus rise from the dead before Jesus did. But what we're saying is that Jesus was the firstborn. He is supreme over all of this. In him, all things are held together. Together, and that he was uh, he he was preeminent because of his position as the Son of God. Verse nineteen says that God, in all His fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. By this statement, Paul was refuting the Greek idea that Jesus could not be human and divine at the same time. That Christ is fully human and fully divine. He's fully God, fully man. For God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Fully God, fully man. Christ has always been God and will always be God. When we have Christ, we have all of God. And the thing is that we shouldn't diminish any aspect of Christ. We shouldn't diminish him because he we because of his humanity and we certainly shouldn't diminish him because of his divinity. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth. How? Because of Christ's blood on the cross. Christ's death provided a way for all people to come to God. This reconciling everything to himself. God had a plan. God's plan was to send his son into the world to pay 
for our sins to, so that we could have access to the Father. He reconciled everything to himself. And what Paul says to the church in Corinth was that we are also ministers of reconciliation, that we have a, a role to play. In this, But only through God, only through Jesus, God has reconciled everything to himself because of Jesus' death on the cross. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth. Christ's death paved the way for all people to come to God. It cleared away the sin that keeps us from having a right relationship with our creator. And this does not mean that everybody has been saved, only that, every, that the path has been cleared for everybody to be saved. Those who will trust in Christ. We can have peace with God and be reconciled to him by accepting Christ who died in our place. The issue is, is there distance between you and God? Is there any distance between you and God? Well, if there is, then, then, then God is saying, hey, I've reconciled everything. That was an awful line. I have reconciled everything to himself. I've paved the way, but I'm also not going to force you to do something that you don't choose to do. It's there. It's free. It's accessible. But you've got to accept it. Is there a distance between you and, and God? The answer is be reconciled to him. Come to him through Jesus. What I love about this is that we see that this whole passage, this whole, this whole verse here, God was pleased to live in Christ. Through him, God reconciled everything to himself. What does that mean by everything? Well, Paul says it in the very next verse, right? He says, this includes who? You. This includes you. Everything includes you who were once far away from God. Is there distance between you and God? Maybe. Maybe. Because you were once far away from God. Those of you who chose to accept Christ, you made the decision to say, hey, I once was far away, but now I'm found. Now I'm close. Now I'm here. It says here, you were enemies separated by, from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Doesn't that sound so malicious? Like I was, my, my evil thoughts. You were his enemies. Some say, some translations say that you were his enemies in your mind. Not that you did something intentionally that said, you know what, I am now enemies with God, that I'm going to go against him and his authority, that I feel like I could beat him. But it says that we were enemies in our minds, like we were separated by him because of some of the sinful actions and thoughts that we have in our mind just from being sinful human beings. But yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. Sin corrupted our way of thinking about God. Wrong thinking leads to sin and which further distorts and destroys our thoughts about him. When we are out of harmony with God, our natural condition was to be hostile towards his standards. That's all it means. And what Paul is literally trying to say to this group of people is that, are, that are being tempted to dabble in all these different religious things and philosophical things, that who are being persuaded to have doubts about Jesus, Paul is saying that this is what Jesus did for us. It was enough. It was complete. It was for all time. You don't need anything else. It's Jesus who did it. God did it through Jesus who is the image of God. This is enough. You don't need to have secret wisdom or secret knowledge. It's through Christ's death of his physical body. That's all there was to it. That's how God reconciled everything to himself, including you. It's not Jesus plus something. It's not Jesus plus whatever they were into at the time. It's not Jesus plus this mysticism or Jesus plus this philosophy or Jesus plus this legalism. It was just Jesus. He was more than enough. He was not only the sustainer of things, but he was sufficient for us. He's all we need. In order to answer the accusation that Jesus was only a spirit and not a true human being, Paul explained that, and this seems so weird to us now, but Paul explained that, you know, Christ died in his physical body. But Paul needed to intentionally put that in there because there was this, this undercurrent of thought that Jesus, that Christ was only spiritual, that he wasn't physical because God wouldn't have created, you know, Jesus wouldn't, God wouldn't be in a physical body. So Paul's saying, no, 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 look, 
We know Jesus was and, and the, is God. We know he's the image of God and death of Christ in his physical body. That had to be in there. He suffered death fully as a human so that we could be assured that he died in our place and that he truly removed our sin. So then we get to the very last verse of this chapter, verse, ch verse 23. It says this, it says, but you must. Oh, let me, before that, go back. As a result... He has brought you into his presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. It's done. That's all it is. That's all there is. That's all there has to be. He's saying that, that without, with, with, because of this action, because of Jesus' death on the cross, this is all there was to it. You are holy and blameless, and you stand without him, before him without a single fault. How many of you believe that? We can get deluded and delusional about where we stand with God. It's easy for us to feel like, you know what, I know I got a lot of faults. I know, I got, I, I know there's a lot of blame to go around. Does that mean that we don't mess up? We don't need forgiveness? Absolutely. I mess up all the time. But it's, it's that I, I know my standing with God is holy and blameless. I stand without him before, without a single fault because I'm in relationship with him. Because we have, because of Christ's actions and his death on the cross, we have forgiveness for all sins. It's not like he forgave a you know, percentage of our sins. He forgave all of our sins. We are standing before him without a single fault. And so what it says in verse 23 is that we must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away, the verse says. Uh, in the following verse, from the assurance that you received when you heard the good news. You don't drift away from the assurance you received. Don't drift away. Paul is saying, hey, church in Colossae, you heard the good news. In fact, we talked about it last week, how this good news is spreading all throughout the world. How the good news can't be diluted. How the good news is bearing fruit everywhere. It's changing lives everywhere, just as it changed their life from the day they heard about it. And Paul is encouraging them and challenging them, hey, don't drift away from that assurance. You can have confident hope in, in, in God because of what God, oh, Jesus has done for you. Don't drift away from that assurance. Don't be, don't, don't be entangled by all these, these, these philosophies and ideologies and things that you're trying to mix with Christianity. Don't, don't get entangled in all that. Jesus himself is enough. The way to be free from sin is to trust that Jesus Christ will take it away. We have to remain rooted and established and firm in the truth of the gospel, putting our confidence in Jesus alone to forgive our sins. We must believe that Jesus is God. Or else the Christian faith is hollow, it's mis misdirected, it's meaningless. This is a central truth of Christianity, that Jesus is the image of God. But we have to continue to believe this truth. And we have to continue to believe. And we have to stand firmly in it. Stand firmly in it. The good news has been preached all over the world. And I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. He ends this chapter how he began it. He says, I am Paul. I'm a servant of Christ. Here to proclaim the gospel. That no one is greater than Jesus. That he's him. That he's the real, real. He was there in the beginning. He holds everything together. He is the head of the church. It all started with him. This movement is all about him. Supremacy belongs to Jesus. He is him. Jesus was the highest, has the highest superiority and complete sovereignty. His reign is supreme. No one can hold a candle to what he has done. No one has ever lived the life that he lived. No one has ever raised themselves from the grave. He is the image of God who gives us access to the Father. God does what the law and what wisdom could not do. 
through Jesus, the life that the law sought to give is found in Jesus. Nowhere else should we look for forgiveness for the past, maturity in the present, and hope for the future. He is him. Paul says in another epistle, says he closes the epistle with this. He says, now to the king, eternal, immortal, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He's him. Let's pray this morning. Father.